All righty. Well, thank you so much. I'm Barton George. I'm coming to you live from just outside of Austin, Texas, and I'm joined here by Florian Coulombel. And Florian, you are coming for us, uh, from France. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get let's get going without further ado. And so what we'll start with is just give you a quick overview of what we're going to be touching on today. So the main topics are going to be modern IT, DevOps, automation, and how those three interact. And then I will be giving it over to Florian at a couple of times to do two demos, one that's going to be talking about Kubernetes and persistent storage, and the other one he's going to be using Ansible to automate storage at scale. So with that, let's let's kick it off. So if we start back with a little bit of history, getting to DevOps, it all started a, few, a decade plus ago with the rise of the developer. So originally what you had was you had the business on one side, the customers on the other, and then developers and, and IT ops in the middle. The problem was, is there were quite a bit of Quite, there was quite a bit of friction uh, between the developers and operations who were not, uh, not aligned between each other. Then along came the cloud, open source, and REST, RESTful APIs. What this allowed the developers to do was to go to the public cloud, get compute resources there by putting them on their credit card. They didn't need to go to procurement to get the OK. They were able to get, of course, open software off the web. Uh, and then REST APIs are something that actually came from the ground up that were supported by developers. They were a reaction against the uh, SOAP protocols that had been put together by Microsoft, Sun, IBM, et cetera, that had come down from on high. Uh, and, and what happened instead was developers on their own started using REST APIs uh, and those bubbled up and then became the de facto APIs that were being used. So what it first started out with is using these technologies by the developers to circumvent customers. By doing that, they were able to work, uh, move more quickly, more agilely, and this uh, allowed them to be much more innovative. The business then took note of this innovation, the ability for developers to uh, respond more quickly to market conditions and customers, and they threw their weight behind developers at the expense of operation. With this uh, support, these three technologies then came into the enterprise, uh, out of the shadows and into the officially sanctioned technologies used by the, by the organization. And what this also did was this, this sowed the seeds for what would now become modern IT. So getting from traditional to modern IT, there are a bunch of characteristics that, that uh, would uh, quantify and qualify what's, uh, what modern IT is. And you can see them here on the left, things like automation, which we'll talk about more, integration, cooperation between developers and operations, scalability, big concept there, self-service, and this goes for both developers as well as IT ops, and then this idea of infrastructure as code, the idea that hardware doesn't go away, but you interact with it through code rather than working with hardware directly. So if we look at the way the product team is organized, rather than having individual ops people in silos, like the orange boxes down below, where you had people tied to specific hardware types, servers, storage, and, and networks, operations in a modern IT uh, space has to reinvent themselves to take on a much broader set of skills and, and responsibilities. So they go from focusing on one type of, of technology to a whole myriad of components and phases and operations that they need to do to support the cloud native application developer. And they do that by setting up and maintaining a, a multi-cloud platform. So if you think of the cloud native uh, application developers, what they're doing is they're making use of the platform. They don't know anything about what's, what's underneath the covers. In fact, that's what 
that's what they prefer. Just like with a car, most of us don't know what kind of spark, uh, spark plugs or carburetor that we may have under the hood. All we care is that it gets us to work, takes us to the beach, takes the kids to soccer practice. And we just wanna be uh, interacting with it and using it for what we need it for. So these individuals then go and they build uh, secure applications. And these are often including containers and microservices. And in this uh, case of the operations, as I mentioned, they have to reinvent themselves by upskilling and taking on a much broader set of responsibilities. They work now with the platform rather than individual pieces of hardware, and they manage that platform through software. So now underpinning all of this is DevOps. And why did DevOps come along? Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's this friction or what they call the wall of confusion that existed between developers and operations. Developers would write code that worked on their laptop, toss it over the wall, and then ops would have to try and implement these, try to scale it so that it actually could be used in production. And then, of course, when things went down, there was a lot of finger pointing. You had developers saying, "What? why did my code go down? It, uh, you screwed up in the, in the implementation of it. Ops said, no, we did what we, we needed to do. You wrote bad code. Once again, not good for business, not good for, for anyone. So in reaction to that, along comes DevOps. And if we look and think of the main tenets of DevOps, it's predominantly a cultural change, or at least I should say that DevOps methodology is enabled by culture more than anything else. As I said, this idea of rather than being adversaries, it's about the DevOps, sorry, developers and operations working together and operations playing a much different role than they're used to. There's constant feedback, which, is, uh, which leads to iteration, considerable measurement, there's a standardization of processes and then automation. As I said, we'll be talking more about that a bit later. So the overall goal here is to reduce friction and increase velocity. And what we've got uh, in the middle is the DevOps infinity loop, which lays out the different phases in the product life cycle. And what we've done below it is we've taken it and stretched it out just to make it easier to see the steps. So you go from plan to code, test, package, deploy, operate, and monitor. And then as you see at the bottom with the dotted line, you go back to the beginning and, and start all over again. And so this sits on top of the cloud infrastructure and open source. Um, and Florian's gonna be showing you a, a, a demo with a fair amount of open source in it. And the, the technologies leveraged are micro, uh, microservices which sit within containers which then in turn are managed by Kubernetes. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Florian, who's gonna show you a little bit, a little bit of um, the DevOps life, life cycle, Kubernetes, automation, and more. Thank you, Barton. So in the following demo, uh, we are going to show how Dell can help you and help uh, IT to deliver on the promises of DevOps and self-service provision. So the demo will be uh, showing a, a modern development pipeline based on open source technologies, namely GitLab to store uh, the code, tickets, and more important, the agent to run CI/CD, Kubernetes to orchestrate and execute uh, the application backed by uh, Dell technologies for servers and storage. So let me just switch over to the demo. So this demo um, runs on top of a bare metal, normal vanilla Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the idea here is to have a, an application model view controller based on Vue.js, Ruby for the web app, and a small database, uh, SQLite, backed by PowerMax storage array. PowerMax is our uh, high-end uh, storage friend. And the main idea here will be for every time we want to spin a branch, create a branch, test our application, we will set up a new environment with both the modified code and the infrastructure to execute this code. So, 
the demo runs as is. Uh, I have my application, JavaScript for the front end, Ruby for the web app, like I said, and my database on on uh, on um, file system. I have my code stored right into the GitHub, the GitLab, sorry. <laughs> Uh, with my GitHub agent, I have two main build steps, one for development, which means that for every branch I will have in my repository, every uh, development, uh, every, every time I will develop a new feature, I will create a branch and I will build a new environment and deploy it within Kubernetes. And the second step is for uh, my main application, the production, the latest branch, uh, which will have its um, deployment as well. So, yeah, the idea here is every time you need something, there will be a space for the developer to play with. We are going to use Elm Package Manager to deploy the application and uh, the different flavors. And we will also take advantage of the CICD agent. So anytime we decide to merge a branch, we will squeeze the infrastructure as well. That is to say, we'll purge storage and the runtimes. My application, thanks to Kubernetes state machine, is declared in a very simple YML. Hey, I need the stateful set with the name of my feature. And I need a persistent volume backed by, in this case, the storage. Max. Every day, uh, storage array has CSI plugin, so you can use the same case for any any time of any type of um, Dell storage packet. So right now, I have a single branch master. I'm connecting to my production system. I'm creating to dos, and now the magic happens. The magic will start. Sorry, I'll create a new branch, and I decide, hey, it would be nice to try out a new feature to change colors. So creating my branch changing colors, committing my code, and pushing it to my repository. So thanks to the CICD pipeline, I will build my new branch, and more interestingly, create a new environment based on that, backed by uh, Dell Infrastructure. As you can see, I have two PVs, two persistent volume, one for my production, one for my development environment. Any Dell storage driver supports full uh, life cycle of volume. So I could have cloned my production data or take a snapshot or restore it, or just like here, spin a new volume. So going back to my, again, my new dev environment, opening the URL and tada, I have my new colors. I can create and insert new data. And now let's say I'm going to change my colors. Here again, I will go to VS Code, commit my new colors, push it to my branch, re-execute the pipeline. And of course, since it was already deployed for this system, the persistent data is still there and my new application applies. Uh, we can also take advantage of quota management to make sure that developers are not uh, consuming or over consuming storage. In this case, I'm going to use Kubernetes built-in quota management, but Dell offers also uh, fine-grained uh, quota management through an open source module that will allow you to overall manage quota for different Kubernetes clusters. So in this case, I'm creating a quota, very simple one. Hey, I just one PV maximum of 10 gigabytes overall. So if I'm creating a new feature, a new branch, let's say I'm going to change titles, how it's being built, creating new branch. And you will assume that when you will push it, it will spin yet another environment with yet another P. But because I set the quota, this, of course, won't happen. So building steps and redeploying against my Kubernetes infrastructure with a nice message that says, hey, we breach our quotas. So the main purpose of this demo was really to show you that we uh, at Dell are uh, spending quite some time in developing all the plugins to make these promises of DevOps and frictionless application to production a reality. 
So, Bhaktan, I will pass over to you. Over Thank you very much. Following. And of course, because this is a Linux Foundation event, this was running on Linux, uh, Fedora to be exact. So, now we're back to automation as i promised and so this is automation is something i talked about it in the in the context of devops and modern it it's something that gives you much more of a competitive advantage it gives you more agility uh, greater quality but even more importantly none of this really would be uh, possible without automation so today it environments as i'm sure you're aware are scaling out in fact many times you're using multi-cloud platforms that go beyond the walls of your it environment and without automation this this really isn't possible so it, it gives you control it gives you efficiency as i mentioned um, and all of these are key to scale and to gain speed um, and if you were to do this in the in a traditional manner that was manual uh, manual in nature, this really wouldn't this really wouldn't work. Um, so you do get it does enable things like the scale on, as we talked about there, uh, DevOps infrastructure as code, and then self service functionality. So let's go now to a bit of a, a bit of a history lesson here. If we look at where where automation has come from if you remember it originally started out with ticket-based automation and so here to configure what you needed to do is you needed to manually configure something uh, they were needs were put in by tickets uh, and you also had to manage uh, and verify configuration software you have to manually verify that Next step, of course, was, was scripting, which provided automation. It did give you pre-configured infrastructure and you, and you could get it through a self-service portal. Uh, the problem was that the scripts themselves could be difficult to track and require maintenance and updates. And so when you get to today, you get to infrastructure as code, which I uh, introduced back when we're talking about both modern IT as well as DevOps. And in this case, the changes are automatically recorded uh, and versioned in source code libraries, just like application code itself. So verification can be automated. You can uh, automate things. Uh, and it, what an infrastructure technician does, they take the infrastructure design, they check it into a source code repository. Once again, just like code itself, it then aut automatically configures the infrastructure using APIs and the continuous delivery pipeline. And it continues to then also verify the configuration of infrastructure. Uh, and then next, the uh, last of the, of the automation, before I turn it back over to you, Florian, in a cloud native world, as we talked about, that's characterized by microservices, containers, and Kubernetes, developers are looking for self-service, as we talked about, uh, and they need access to platforms where they don't want to know what's under the cover. All they want to know is that they can spin up a, a MySQL, they can get access to, to TensorFlow. They don't care where the, where the applications themselves are running, whether it's in your IT environment, outside of them, on VMs, containers, bare metal. That's not important to them. Um, so what, as I said, what they really want to do is they just want to get the technology they want and be able to easily uh, um, get access and, and use it. And so the, the use cases that you see there on the right, you need that uh, applications need to be backed up. They also need to be mobile. I mean, it needs to move from one infrastructure to another, which is particularly important in the multi-cloud world. And then workloads need to be optimized, which means that the IT orgs uh, and then the consumers, who in this case we're referring to as the application developers, since they're the ones who are actually uh, consuming the infrastructure, they need to they need to be uh, provided, and they also need the uh, workload analysis that uh, available to them. So with that, let me just turn this over now uh, to Florian, and here you're going to see some automation uh, along with score, uh, scaling out storage. And he will show you this now using Ansible. Away, Florian. Thank you, Barton. So in this second demo, uh, we are going to show something that has been uh, implemented for a, a university. 
Um, the idea here is a bit more uh, a use case based uh, for sysadmin. Uh, the concept will be to use Ansible playbook to manage um, home directories for users. So just one second, let me open the video. <coughs> So we are using, we are going to use um, Ansible uh, playbooks, Ansible modules for uh, Dell PowerScale. Dell PowerScale is an unstructured uh, data storage uh, to store um, file, file storage, oriented to file storage. Uh, it has support for protocol like NFS, HTFS, S3, etc., etc. This platform is really scalable and, uh, and is easily used for um, tons of use cases, uh, genomics, uh, media, et cetera, et cetera. So the ground idea here is to, again, building on top of the uh, DevOps uh, concepts, we are going to use Active Directory as the one and only source of truth for the user base. And out of these users, we will create a directory within the Isilon and then mount this directory, this on directory into the Unix server through NFS. So that way, you know, we are uh, building something that is uh, more secure, uh, very fast to uh, add or remove user, uh, reproducible, and you don't have to maintain some big CMDB with list of users and so on. No, here the referential is Active Directory, and it will be the source of truth to manage everything in this case. So we'll have a, a playbook, Ansible playbook, that will connect to AD, get the list of teachers, the list of students, and then create the own directory and mount the share on the Unix systems. So, for that demo, uh, we cooked a, a container that has all the dependencies to execute the Ansible module, so Ansible itself, and the dependencies to access uh, Active Directory and the PowerScale Isilon. Within like many Ansible infrastructure, we have a couple of files with uh, credentials. How I'm going to access uh, PowerScale the Unix systems and Active Directory. The first step of this playbook is to build two lists, list of students and list of teachers. Why is that? It's because we're gonna apply different policies if you are a student or a teacher. So we just connect to the AD, query the groups uh, per name, are you students or teacher? And we cook that list. We create the base directory to store our on the air. And in this step, the EMC Isilon file system, we are going to create uh, the OMDR for each student with a dedicated quota and the permission coming from the AD. So in this case, uh, students have just uh, five, five gigabytes of storage associated to them. This is just a simple loop uh, and we loop over. And for the teachers, uh, we are going to apply a different quota, which was 100 gigabytes. The next step of this playbook is to also implement some protection policies. A, we want to take a snap of every on directory every day at uh, midnight. And for students, we'll keep this uh, snapshot for just a few days, while within the, uh, for the teachers, we'll keep that for a month. We create the exports within the Isilon PowerScale. And then, you know, we connect to the Unix and point to the share to update the FS tab and say, hey, to mount the Undir, uh, go to uh, the NFS server hosted by Isilon PowerScale. One other thing we do is, uh, as I said several times already, the Active Directory being the source of truth, uh, we also, every time we run the Ansible playbook, we check if there are orphan directories. And orphan directories is uh, an existing directory, but no user creating for it within the AD. And every time we catch on this uh, orphan directory, we just apply the Ansible uh, role to remove it. Uh, I flagged all these tasks as cleanup to make it easier to manage. And now, Let's have a look at the real gig. I'm connecting to one of my Unix server. 
slash home is empty. And now I'm executing my playbook through Podman because I built a container image, querying the AD, creating the file systems, the snapshot policies, mounting everything, and looking for fun, there are none. And now I can go ahead and I can see that there was uh, several uh, user created. Oops, as well as my snapshot policies. As you can see. <coughs> now let's remove one of my users and re execute the same uh, playbook with the tag cleanup. So it will look for often there and squeeze the directory. So once again, this demo was to uh, illustrate that uh, at Dell, uh, we are developing and maintaining lots of uh, tools and playbook to enable the DevOps, uh, to enable the DevOps process. Um, so Florian, before you go on, a question came through uh, since you're still on the uh, demo. How can these credentials be secured? We saw them in plain text. Yes, so that's correct. So within a, within a real uh, setup, you will use uh, something like uh, Ansible Tower or Ansible AWX, where you will store this credential within a, an encrypted database. So instead of giving the plain text credential, you will have a token that will connect to an encrypted database uh, through this uh, infrastructure, this global infrastructure, Ansible Tower, Ansible AWX. And that way you can secure them, yeah. Thank you. So these tools are part of the uh, Ansible family, uh, how to store um, securely credentials. Uh, all right. So yeah, um, as I was saying, we, we just kind of uh, scratch the surface of uh, the number of tools and uh, open source project we contribute to, uh, to, to, to enable developers and operations sysadmin to uh, implement on DevOps. So for example, we are building uh, container modules to uh, have um, uh, telemetry to be able for each volume you provision through uh, Kubernetes driver to be able to measure the response time, the IOPS, the capacity. We are developing uh, software to protect your data sets uh, within, within uh, Kubernetes workloads, et cetera, et cetera. One big commitment we have uh, to the community and to our customer is also to make sure everything we do is by the book uh, Ansible and Kubernetes wise, meaning that every quarter we are going to release a new version of Kubernetes drivers, uh, qualify them against a wide range of distribution. As you can see, we qualify them against uh, Mirantis, uh, Kubernetes engine, uh, Kubernetes Vanilla, obviously, OpenShift, VMware Tenzu, Amazon uh, EKS, uh, Google Entos, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> so all of these are, again, uh, done so you can have self-service provisioning, you can build reproducible infrastructure and benefit from all the goodness that uh, Barton described uh, just a minute ago around DevOps uh, culture. Uh, Barton, do you want to run the conclusion here? Sure. So thanks, Florence. Before we go to questions, I wanted to let you all know that as of two months ago, we launched developer.dell.com, which you should go and check out. It's got our APIs, and within that, a lot of links to GitHub. You also can get to our GitHub repos directly by going to github.com slash Dell. Besides the, besides the APIs, we have lists of webinars and events coming up. Um, and we have our DevOps page link, so you can go and learn more about the solutions we have in the in the DevOps area. So this, as I said, this was kicked off two months ago, and we will be adding more APIs to the overall library. We'll be adding more content as we go forward. Look for code there. Look for white papers, videos, uh, all more, all of this to come. So so stay tuned. Uh, and with that, I will open it up to any questions that there might be.
and one thing I should I should say you're probably aware of it those who work with uh, infrastructures code but this is for those who are not as familiar this is akin to the shift that was made when we went to VMs and VM uh, admins had to work through uh, an abstracted layer of software to work to uh, work with the hardware very similar to that that change that we saw at that point so I see one question here. How can we back up and restore the data? So in the case of um, Kubernetes backed uh, persistent storage, um, every down Kubernetes driver supports uh, snapshot capabilities. So natively within your uh, cube, you can describe, hey, I want a kind snapshot on this volume and you can restore it using the similar uh, type of directives. Hey, I want to restore a PV based on that snapshot. Um, we also offer a solution built on top of open source software as well to uh, create policies to take snapshot at a regular basis, for example. Uh, Kubernetes related as well, um, pretty much all Dell storages offers uh, replication between sites. So if you want to build true HA type of uh, microservices uh, on-prem, you can leverage this uh, open source Dell container storage module to uh, take advantage of that. With uh, Ansible and other uh, tools we provide within that, uh, that domain, uh, you can use pretty much what I described. You know, you have an Ansible role, you create, you will leverage the persistent storage to uh, the capacities of a, of a Dell storages to build these snapshot capabilities. A, I want to create a snapshot every X amount of time, and it will create the snapshot policies. We have the same type of role to restore them. I hope that answers. Also, maybe one, one, one more thing here, um, talking about open source as well. So we do embrace the open source movement, trying to contribute to the community through different channels. And all the documentations, the travel ticketing system, the milestone and everything, it's available through GitHub. So we also have uh, from GitHub, within the GitHub, a, a portal with all the docs and all the information you may want um, and need to implement such features. Any more questions, comments, concerns? Going once, mm -hmm. twice, thrice. So I'd, uh, before I hand it back over to the Linux Foundation, I'd also like to say that what I'm focusing on now is building out Dell's developer community. And as you can see, as I mentioned before, we just launched this site, so we're very early on. But we would love any input from you all as far as what you'd like to see, what, what you think would be helpful, um, whether that's content on the website, um, videos that you'd like to see, white papers you'd like to see, very interested in, in, in hearing that. So we will be putting that functionality here on the site for you to um, submit, the, submit your input. But in the meantime, if you want to do it publicly, you can uh, send a a tweet to me. I'm at Barton808. So the number is 808 and my first name. Otherwise, you can actually email me directly at barton.george at dell.com. So on one, behalf one, of, yeah. One more question here. Um, so the question is, can you elaborate a bit more on storage class? Does it allow read, write many, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> indeed the storage class, is the entry to configure uh, how you want um, the, the consumers to access your storage. So within this storage class, depending on the platform, you will have some parameters. Do you want to create, to create Finland or Ficklands? Uh, do you want to um, use certain pool or uh, use certain characteristics, etc., etc.? So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, most of the time, it will have uh, the, the parameter, what's the storage array you want to access. Uh, we support for all Dell storage, uh, block storage, uh, we support uh, uh, read write once, read write pods, uh, and whole block storage access. For read write many, 
which means uh, you have multiple nodes, distributed nodes uh, accessing the same volume. Uh, we support this uh, through NFS because you know uh, you need a file system that supports concurrency to ensure you can have uh, read write many. So this is done through uh, NFS access, and this is and this is available for um, some of the uh, storage that supports NFS. Um, almost all of them <laughs> are supporting NFS these days. So yeah, read write many through through NFS, and then you know there are been this project we launch. Um, so the CSI specification is what's the standard? What Kubernetes needs you to implement uh, to, to fit with the um, storage lifecycle, create volume, clone volume, expand, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, to circumvent certain limitation of the CSI spec, or because we wanted to expose more features, more data services directly self-service, uh, no hassle from Kubernetes, we created a bunch of um, Dell container storage modules to fill that role. So for example, you can take not only snapshots, but group of snapshots. Uh, you have application running on multiple volume and you want to snap them all at once. Uh, you can do that through that features. There is the telemetry I mentioned. Uh, we improved on the, the detection of a net failure. Uh, we do uh, support for replications, et cetera, et cetera. So, and again, if you want to know more, um, everything is on GitHub and each driver comes with uh, multiple example of storage classes. So you can see what are the different parameters you can tweak. Great. Any other last minute questions? We're, we're happy to field them. I will turn them all over to Florian if they're difficult. Um, <laughs> oh, we, we got another one. So maybe this one is more for your but button. Do mm -hmm. you think there are application or company which do, does not use uh, DevOps Kubernetes today? Um, me, I'm working in the Kubernetes field. So I would say, Pretty much every company I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with have at least Kubernetes project, but uh, there are still plenty of companies that do not have um, Kubernetes projects. Um, so I'm in France, you know, and uh, I'm dealing sometimes with customer on uh, public healthcare and they, they haven't really begun on this Kubernetes journey because they serve application, they, they are using medical application that are not containerized themselves. So, you know, um, as soon as their business internal uh, application moves to container, they will make a move. But for now, they are still hanging uh, behind the scene for this. Yeah, and I would agree. I think, well, modern IT, Kubernetes, DevOps is the way that we're, we're going. And there are quite a bit of companies who are there using that to make their digital transformation. For others, it's still early days. So you will have a lot of people doing pilots with Kubernetes, um, implementing DevOps within smaller groups. I know we ourselves did it first in our, um, our Dell.com IT infrastructure team, where we went and completely revamped our, uh, our set of engineers, just because if, if not, then we're not able to, to keep up with, um, with our customers and, and the changes. I think one thing I know talking to one customer when I was talking to them about uh, uh, implementing DevOps and, and if they had done that, he said, well, we're kind of DevOps-ish. So I think there's people with a, a lot of interest, a lot of passion, but they're um, not all are quite there yet, but a lot of interest. All right. Any more? And well, once, twice, and once again, thrice. All righty. Well, thank you very much, um, Linux Foundation and Florian. And with that, let me turn it back over to you. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much, Barton and Florian, again for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So we hope to see you for future webinars. Thank you so much again. Have a good day. Thank you.